a destination for NASA's Viking spaceship. Here's our first view. No little green men on the red planet. A big red-headed rookie, Bill Walton, after a spectacular career at UCLA, was expected to carry the Portland Trailblazers to the NBA playoffs. Walton showed flashes of brilliance, but injuries put off Bills and the Blazers rise to the top. Golden State's Rick Barry made 1975 a golden year for the Warriors. That trademark underhand free throw was just one of the weapons Barry used to hold together a band of rookies and less than superstars. Barry's Warriors made the NBA Finals, but no one thought they could beat the Washington Bullets, who'd won 60 games during the season and whipped the Celtics in the Eastern playoffs. In the Finals, number 41, Wes Unsell, showed some of the stuff that made the Bullets so tough. But Barry was better, better than anybody. Watch him with the steal here. Now he finds the open man. After averaging better than 30 points a game during the season, in the finals, Barry scored 118 points in just four games. All Golden State needed to sweep the bullets for the NBA title. In the 1975 Stanley Cup Finals, goalie Bernie Perrant was a brick wall for Philadelphia. The explosive Buffalo Sabres bombarded him with shots, but Perrant allowed just one goal in the first two games, and the Flyers took both of them. Game three, hockey's fog bowl. Steam rose off the melting buffalo ice in the late spring heat. It was 87 degrees at rinkside, and Perrant would have to defend against pucks that were playing hide and seek. In sudden death, Buffalo's Gil Perot bounced it off the boards. Rene Robert got it, score! And the Sabres would also win game four to tie the series. Game five. Bob Kelly gets the Flyers rolling. Now it's Dave Schultz. And Reggie Leach added still another in a 5-1 Flyer route. They need just one more now. Game six was scoreless until the third period when Bob Kelly raced down the ice. Fought his way out from behind the net and finally stuffed it in. Perrault and the fire defense took it from there, and a six-game shutout took the 1975 Stanley Cup for the Philadelphia Flyers. Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. No one will ever forget 1975's Thriller in Manila. They go right to work in round one. Ali goes at Frazier hard. Ali has the title, but both these men are champions, and they prove it today. Watch this love tap from Joe. In round three, Ali tries the rope-a-dope, but the champ breaks out of it with a flurry. It's all Ali so far. In the ninth, Ali isn't playing rope a Frazier's assault has him worn out. Joe's nailing him. But no one could take a punch better than Ali. Round 13, Frazier's mouthpiece goes flying, a vicious right from the champ. The 33-year-old Ali has reached inside himself and found the stamina and speed of a 20-year-old. Round 14, Frazier won't give up, can't give up in his last shot at Ali. Two legends of the ring calling each other to greatness. Ali is spent, but Frazier is beaten. Joe's handlers end it, and Muhammad Ali is still 
champion of the world. In 1975, the Red Sox went for their first World Series victory in quite a while. Before this try in 75, when was the Sox last series win? A 1975 Red Sox fan would have had to have been around in 1918 to remember seeing his team win a World Series. They defeated the Chicago Cubs when Babe Ruth was still with Boston and still a pitcher. In a 1975 breakthrough, Frank Robinson became baseball's first black manager. The two-time MVP called the shots for the Cleveland Indians and hit a few shots too. He put himself in the lineup in his first game at the helm and belted his 575th career homer. And then, Robbie reminded us of the man who paved the way. If I had one wish to, to be answered right today, that is the one wish I would have that Jackie Robinson could be here to see this happening this moment. The Boston Red Sox went for that long sought after series title with the ageless Luis Tiad on the mound in game one. Carl Yastrzemski, no youngster himself, helped Tiad shut down the Reds. Since he aced Don Gullett, lost his stuff in the seventh. Yastrzemski singles with Tiad on. Louis finally makes his way home as the Sox take game one. The Reds even the series in game two. And in game three, with Mrs. Pete Rose leading cheers, the Reds got the call on one of the most controversial plays in any series. Tenth inning, Ed Armbrister up, Carlton Fisk catching. A bunt, there's contact. Fisk throws it away, everybody's safe. Boston manager Daryl Johnson wants interference called on Armbrister. You're going to make a ruling on that, but I want you to explain exactly what you were looking at when you called the play. Okay, the guy, the ball was hit, he was moving for the ball, and the runner was moving to first. The runner was all over the right, catcher in there. I can't help that, it happened right there. I'll tell you one, Jang, it's a loud operation, and you and I know it right now. It's a loud operation. Two batters later, National League MVP Joe Morgan belted one deep enough to score Cesar Geronimo, and the Reds took game three. Cincy then built a 3-2 lead in the series. Game six could be goodbye for Boston. Super rookie Fred Lynn got Boston going in the first. A three-run shot for the American League's MVP and rookie of the year. Luis Tiant had a quick three-run lead as he went for his third win of the series. But Tiant would lose his grip. In the seventh, George Foster puts the Reds ahead with a two-run double. The Reds made it 6-3 in the eighth. In the bottom of the eighth, Rolly Eastwick faces Boston pinch hitter Bernie Carbo with two on. This game's all tied up. Thanks to the clutch hitting of Bernie Carbo, the Red Sox are still alive. It went to the 12th inning. Pat Darcy faces Carlton Fisk. Hit deep to left. Can Fisk keep it there? It's off the foul pole, a home run. Cork Fisk hit a shot hurt all over New England and sent this series to game number seven. Game seven, three three in the ninth. Joe Morgan up with two on. Just a little looper to center, but it falls in front of Fred Lynn. Ken Griffey scored, and series MVP Pete Mose hustles to third. And that one run will do it. Will McEnany gets Yaz on a lazy fly to center, and it's all over. The Reds are world champions, but in a series like this one, no one could be called a loser. Pele, one of the greatest athletes of all time, 
But in 1975, a man most Americans had never heard of. He had led Brazil to four World Cup championships. Now, Pele came out of retirement to join the New York Cosmos and put soccer on the map in America. Watch this header here. Pele electrified North American soccer league fans and a legend around the world became an American hero. The Heisman Trophy has been won by some of the greatest football players ever to lace up the cleats. But until 1975, no one had ever won the award twice. Who was the collegiate superstar who won his second Heisman Trophy in 1975? The end of the road is just the beginning when you take it on with these B.F. Goodrich TA radios. The radial ball terrain. The mud terrain. Hey Griffin. In 1975, Archie won his second Heisman Trophy and became the only player ever to win the award twice. Ohio State coach Woody Hayes built his offense around Archie Griffin. The thing about this eye back that it took us quite a while to learn, uh, by putting him back quite a ways, he can hit any hole on that entire line of scrimmage. So they can't overshift him. If they do, they pay for it. Griffin set an all-time NCAA career rushing mark and set another record by rushing for 100 yards or better in 31 consecutive games. There were bigger backs, there were faster backs, but there weren't any better running backs than Archie Griffin. He was the heart of an Ohio State team that went undefeated in 1975 and nearly won the national championship. In 1975, Archie Griffin was college football's best single player, but Oklahoma was the nation's number one team. Coach Barry Switzer introduced opponents to the All-American Selman Brothers. Here's Dewey Selman, number 91. And here's Leroy, number 93. The Sooner wishbone offense was awesome. Elvis Peacock was just one gun in an attack that gave Oklahoma all the options and left the enemy with none at all. Here's Joe Washington. Try to cut with him, said Switzer, and you'll break both knees and both ankles. And if all that wasn't enough to do you in, quarterback Steve Davis could finish you off in the air. Billy Brooks hauled this one in for Oklahoma, national champs for 1975. Super Bowl IX, the Vikings and the Steelers were both going for their first ever pro championship. The Steelers did it with defense. Fran Tarkenton and Dave Osborne flew this connection. Tarkenton's on the ball, but the Steelers are on him. And the men in purple start singing the blues. Tarkenton goes to John Gilliam who finds out how tough these Steelers are. Gilliam survived that train wreck, but Mel Blount ended up with the football, and a rare Viking drive went by the boards. Terry Bradshaw had it easy. Just give it to Franco Harris and watch him roll. Franco picks up nine of his 158 yards and a Steeler touchdown. Minnesota got all of 17 yards on the ground. And their passing game? The Steelers had Fran the Scram running for his life. White White deflects it. And all pro mean Joe Green picks it off. The steel curtain dropped on the Vikings. And Chuck Knoll's Steelers were Super Bowl champs in 1975. The USO 